Congratulations, all right. Um, everybody's telling everybody that we are live. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Rorisan Tandikiso. Welcome to Bible study. We gather here every single Thursday at 7 p.m. Um, and um, Fridays at um, Fridays at Fridays at 5 a.m. we come together. It's a bit weird. I'm coming live. Sound like a TV presenter. Coming to you live from New York. Live from New York. <laughs> I'm all the way in New York uh, doing amazing things with Momentum. We thank God for them. Uh, it's been a, an amazing experience. I've met incredible individuals and um, God has just been good. And um, I think I'll share a little bit about that a little bit later on. Uh, I am on the clock, but what we have committed ourselves to doing is that Jesus, this Jesus, that team is doesn't matter where we are in the world, doesn't matter <laughs> what is happening. We will make time. We will create space. We will create time to make sure that we're together as a family. Uh, so I want to just welcome you all. Thank you so much for coming through. What time is it there? It is 1 p.m. Uh, 1 p.m. I've been up since 3 a.m. Haven't been able to sleep. Uh, jet lag showing me a bit of flames. I woke up very hungry at 3 a.m. I think that was like 9 a.m. for you guys. So my body was just going, something is wrong. Hmm? Something is wrong. Uh, but like I said, we've committed as the Jesus is Jesus that uh, team and family that, uh, you know, we're going to make this a priority. And uh, whether we're working, whether we're doing whatever... Uh, we will always create space and time, you know, for us to be together. So, okay, I'm obviously not in my usual space, so you guys will tell me if the sound is good, if you can hear me loud and clear. How about you go over and tag a friend, remind them, say to them, wake up, it's time for us, um, uh, you know, to get going. Uh, I see my, my new best friend, uh, he's a fantastic artist, fantastic artist, I met him yesterday. Um, uh, he says, I've been chopping Biltong. I have been chopping Biltong. Uh, he hooked me up with Biltong yesterday. Um, but yeah, I think let's pray. Let's get into today and let's thank God. Has my accent changed? <laughs> New York. <laughs> I hope my accent doesn't change. I'm too ghetto for that, you know. <laughs> See, me, I'm the type I can live here for 10 years. I will still sound the way I'm sounding. Anyway, let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for an opportunity, Mudumaka, for us to come together. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you are uh, a tangible living God. Thank you, Lord God, that we do not take this time lightly, that an opportunity for us to come together to read your word, to to study your word, to, to hear what it is you have in store for us. Lord, we're grateful. Uh, it's a great honor and a pleasure for us uh, to be in your presence. You said if two or three are gathered, you're in our midst. What a privilege to know that God God is in our midst. To know that God himself is in our midst. Thank you, Lord God, that you watch over us. Thank you, Lord God, that you protect us. Thank you, Lord God, that you love us, that you cover us with your mercy and your goodness. But thank you for being in our midst. Ooh, thank you for being our father, our protector. Thank you for being the mighty warrior that you are. Thank you uh, for being the God who uses a hand to wipe out situations. Thank you for being the great man and great God that you are. Thank you. But also thank you for being in our midst. Thank you for solving our problems. Thank you for healing. Thank you for restoring us. Thank you for the covering. Thank you, Lord God, for moving us from point A to B. Thank you that you have kept us. Thank you, Lord God, that you have restored energy and strength into our bodies. Thank you that, Lord God, you have revived situations in our lives. But thank you this afternoon or this evening, Lord God, for being in our midst. Lord God, we remember last week when we were dealing with Adam and Eve, that even after they had wronged you, even after they had moved away from you, even if after they had dispelled themselves from your presence, that you are the same God that went back to the garden. 
thank you for keep coming back for us. Thank you for, for keep coming back. Thank you that you keep coming back for us. And this afternoon, Lord God, we don't take it lightly that you're in our midst. And for that, we give you all the praise and all the honor. For that, we glorify you and we exalt you. For that, we humbly come before your throne and say there's no God like you. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, bless your word, Lord. Bless this time that we have. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for being in our midst. Thank you for being in our midst. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you can pray in the spirit, how about you go about it? Thank you for being in our midst. Woo. The God who walks with us. Thank you for being in our midst. Father, there's somebody who believes you've left them. There's somebody who believes that you're no longer their God. There's somebody this afternoon or this evening who believes that you're not a God who's moving in their behalf. Lord God, I just want to remind their spirit man that you are the God who's in our midst. In fact, Lord God, you call out for us and ask us, where are we? Woo! And this afternoon, Lord God, we want to say we're here. Here for you, here for your presence. Lord God, we're not here for anything but you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We honor you, great king. We honor you, ruler. Woo! We honor you, majesty. We honor you, great Lord. We honor you. We thank you and we give you all the praise and all the glory. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Thank you, Holy Spirit. This is the day that the Lord has made. We shall be glad and we rejoice in it. We haven't even gone anywhere in the presence of the Lord. It's so tangible and so real. And Father, we thank you for that. Woo! If it's your first time, welcome to Bible study. Um, I introduced myself a little earlier on. My name is Aurora Santa I am um, one of the great team members and family of Jesus This, Jesus That. We are a collective um, of young people, young and old actually, that are just on fire for God and want to be deliberate about our participation in the kingdom of God. And this is one of the outlets. We have online, we have physical guess initiatives or projects that we do but this is one of them that is probably one of our most consistent um, we meet every Thursday and Friday morning at 5 a.m. to pray together to read the word and to grow together so if you see a family member who's not here I know a lot of people were worried because I'm out of the country that we will not be having Bible study but God forbid we definitely are going to be having Bible study um, I may not have as much time as I usually have uh, because of the demand of work and some of the things that I need to get done today. Um, but we're going to maximize the time that we have today. I just need somebody to give me a thumbs up and make me comfortable that the sound is good. Is the music a little bit too loud? Okay, we can bring it down. We can definitely bring it down. Is that fine? Is that okay? Is that okay? Thank you so much for tagging one another and letting one another know. Okay, Mahadi says it's fine. We're good with the sound. All righty. Um, so over the past couple of weeks, we have, we've really, we've really, really delved into, you know, I was speaking to, to, to one of my confidants and I was saying, you know, I just wish God would give me such a nice word, you know, like something light <laughs> and like, woo, you know, encouraging that gets us going, you know, you can do it. The Lord says you can, you know, type of thing. And, uh, and God has just kind of kept us as a family in the space where obedience and just the call of God and, and, and recognizing the responsibility of salvation, recognizing the call that God, over, uh, that God has over our lives and also um, just being truthful about where we're at. So I think we've, we've covered quite a lot of things from obedience to figuring out where we are in the scale, um, to, to looking at the lives of men and women of God who, who have made, um, great mistakes and who've made 
great strides for God, who have changed the course for nations uh, because of obedience towards God, who have um, made great mistakes, but God still, you know, we see him come closer to them and, 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 and get them out of the rut that they've put themselves into. And and I think for most times, you know, when I get off the line, I'm just like, oh man, maybe it was a little bit too harsh. And, and I'm always confronted by, you know, God to say that uh, uh, it's it's the word of God and we, we've got to be able to read it for what it is. Uh, and we've got to be able to see God for who he is um, and not just for a trade exchange with him. So I want to implore you that if you're new here, um, you know, we, we really do tell it like it is. Um, uh, it's, it's probably not a shout message all the time or make me feel good message. Uh, but it's a message that's meant to provoke you. That's meant to lead you back to your father. I think that's the most important thing to lead you back to your father. I do apologize for the noise. New York is very loud. I've come to realize. So if you do hear the hustle and bustle in the background, as long as you can hear me, um, I think that's important, but I do apologize in advance. Um, But yeah, it's being conscious. It's being aware. It's being self-aware. And it's being God-aware, right? So those two need to coexist at all times because the Bible speaks about overcoming the flesh. And, And overcoming the flesh means you've got to have an awareness of your flesh, You've got to have an awareness of your limitation. You've got to have an awareness of where you fall short of God's glory. You've got to have an awareness of uh, where, where, where your strength or your capacity could not lead you. And, and, and that's basically what we're trying to do as a family is to have these real conversations, is to look at the word of God and see ourselves. The Bible says the word of God is a mirror unto us. Can we see ourselves? And sometimes we see ourselves in a good light. And sometimes we see ourselves, you know, in a deca deca ring light where you're going, oh, my intent is good, but am I really doing it the way it's meant to be, you know? So that's the mission for us to zone in. If you want a title and if you like titles, I know other people like titles. Um, yeah, the fire must go now. Uh-uh. How long will it stay around? Uh, if you're looking for a title... I was in such a a tug with myself in terms of today, in terms of where to start and, and how to build up. And, and you know me, I love to, let's go chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. And I really, really want to do that. Um, but something in my spirit just says we need to settle right here. We're going to be looking at Exodus 4. So you can kind of open Exodus 4. That's pretty much primarily where we're going to be parked today. If you are looking for a title or an easier way for you to grasp today's message. Uh, I think I wrote it down. I kind of get uh, different. You guys will tell me which one sticks. I said it's a full dress rehearsal. Today we're talking about a full dress rehearsal. Uh, some others will call it a dry run, depending on which industry you're in. They'll say it's a dry run, you know, uh, as an MC, you know, they'll be like, oh, Rory, we just need you to come a little bit earlier or a day before just to go for a dry run to make sure that you know what it is that's going to be taking place. Woo! You see, the dry run is to make sure that you're not caught off guard by anything that is going to take place. Uh, the full dress rehearsal implies that there is a script, there is a manual, there is a program, there is a prescribed way and setting that has already been put in place to say how something is going to play out. When we do a full dress rehearsal is when we play out what has already been prescribed. See, See, the full dress rehearsal from the lines to what we're wearing, to the makeup, to where we're standing, to what who's going to say and when they're going to say it, cannot look any different from what it is we're going to do on the actual day. Woo! So, so we look at Exodus 4 today and we see that God is kind enough. Woo! He is merciful enough. He is a, a, a cognizant of our weaknesses and our flaws enough that he would ensure that there's a full dress rehearsal before the performance as as the script writer as the director 
as the one who is in charge, as the one who is the brain behind this vision that we get to experience. He is merciful and kind enough to create room for us to be unsure, to create room for us to, 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 to be insecure, to, to create room for us to question all the things we need to question, to create room for, for us to wonder enough if, we, if we've learned enough, if we, we know the word enough, if we have the vocabulary enough, if we have the stage presence enough, if we are convincing enough. See, he is merciful enough. Ooh, to give us a full dress rehearsal. We're looking at Exodus 4. It's the story of Moses. Before I get into the story of Moses, I want to backtrack. I always advise you to make sure that you go to the chapters before. It's important for us to read the word in context. So you understand how we got to the place that we are. So I want you when you're in your own time just to spend time with, with Exodus. Look at the first chapters. It's the story of Moses. When we end off uh, Genesis, we, we know that Jacob and his brothers, Joseph and them are, are now moving to Egypt. We're aware that they're starting a new life. And in chapter 1, the Bible says the sons of Israel, that is Jacob, move to Egypt with their father. And it mentions the different sons from Judah uh, uh, to, to, to Simon, to Levi, to Reuben, to Chad, to Asher, and that the brothers were all there. This is the beginning of a new era. Uh, they, they're now in this land. In verse six, still in chapter one, I'm coming to four, park there. The Bible says, in time, Joseph and all of his brothers died ending that entire generation. Woo, it's a word for somebody already. See, see, our generation will end. Some of us, we live like we have forever. See, we have eternity, not forever. Uh, th there's a difference because for forever is a long time. Eternity is a place with God. So the Bible in verse 6, chapter 1 says that Joseph and his brothers all died, ending an era, ending a generation. But it says they descendants, the Israelites, had many children and grandchildren. In fact, they multiplied so greatly, the Bible says, that they became extremely powerful and filled in the land. Just a message there for the moms and the dads who are in us. That it's not your presence that is going to secure the strength and the capacity of your children. Because we can't live forever, but we can live with eternity in mind. Woo! But if we place the seed of eternity in our children, even though we're no longer physically there, woo, they can still grow to be a mighty and powerful nation. I digress. We see that because of the new rulership, the Bible says that, that, that the new king knew nothing about Joseph. The old king did. And this caused an issue and tension because it meant that the Israelites were not treated in the same light because they had forgotten about Joseph. The Bible in verse 11 tells us in chapter 1 that they then now turn into slaves. And, and this new king is, is deliberate about making sure that the descendants, the Israelites, that the children of these brothers who have now passed on are forever held down and kept into slavery. Why does he feel the need? He feels the need to do this because there is a fear that if they continue in their strength, if they continue in their multiplication, if they continue to occupy until God comes. The devil fears that then we then become more powerful than whatever system is in place right now. Woo! 
see, I look at this king and he, and he reminds me about the demonic system that's taking place. The one that is making Christians slaves. How are we slaves? We're slaves by not knowing who we are and whose we are. Because it means anyone can treat us anyway. It means the devil can feed us any lie he wants to feed us. It means the devil can make us a slave when in actual fact we are kings. He subdues them. This is just the backstory. Read this in your own time, chapter one. But the slavery brings us to a very important part of scripture. And that is the introduction of Moses. Because the king was stressed, I'm paraphrasing. He then sends out an instruction that when they give birth, the Israelites, that the midwives, should they find that it's a boy, they should kill the boy and let the girls live. The midwives refuse to do this. They say, we fear God. We can't be killing children because of your decree. And, 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 and God shows mercy on them and covers them. The Bible actually goes on to say that he blesses them with their own families. So Pharaoh is not at the point where he's irritated because things are not happening the way he would want them to happen. He then puts out a decree, verse 22 of chapter 1. The Pharaoh then gave an order to all his people, throw every newborn Hebrew boy into the Nile River, but you may let the girls live. So he finds a, a creative way or another way. See, the devil doesn't come up with anything new. He'll come up with, with a slightly different way to get to the same results. What did he want? The first or the newborn kids, to boys, to be killed. Whether they've been killed by the midwives, whether they've been thrown into the Nile River, he had one mission in mind, and that was to kill them. The enemy comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Nothing is new under the sun. So he finds another way, and this is for the newborns to be thrown in. Fast forward to chapter 2, the birth of Moses. Moses is a Levi. His parents get married. They give birth to a boy. They hide him for three months. The Bible says that the parents could see that there was something special in them. They hid him for three months. Then they knew they could not hide him any further. See, whatever God places in you, eventually will come out. They got to the point where they knew that they could not hide him any longer. This is going to be important for us later. Verse 3. But when she could no longer, this is chapter 2, I'm just passing by, we're going to chapter 4, hey? I'm just passing by, don't stress too much. Read this in your own time. Chapter 2, verse 3. But when... She could no longer hide him. She got a basket and made out of reeds, a waterproof, and waterproofed it with tar and pitch. She put the baby in the basket and laid it amongst the reeds along the bank. Along the river bank. Now the princess, the Pharaoh's daughter, the one who made the decree, goes and baths in the same river. And she hears the baby crying and she sees the baby. Pause, a quick moment for somebody. God's wisdom will be not packaged like the world's wisdom. Oof, how do I say this in the correct way? See, 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 if you know that Pharaoh has made a decree that all newborn babies, boys, must be thrown into the Nile River, personally me, I would stay very far from the Nile River. But God gives the mother wisdom to go to the very place where death has been dangled. To go and face the very place where fear has been brewed. To go to the very place where death has been decreed in order to protect his life. 
Sometimes you're telling your friends what God is telling you to do and they talk you out of it because it sounds nonsensical to take your child to the Nile. Woo! Sometimes you, you want to speak to your partner and, and, and you want to tell them the things that God is saying and, and how we should go about fixing this marriage and, and how we should go about fixing our finances. And, 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 and they seem not to understand how you can possibly take the baby to the Nile River. See, the Nile River is the place of death. But under God's unction, under God's charge, under God's word, the Nile River becomes a place of protection. You're sounding weird to everybody around you. You're looking weird to everybody around you. Everything that you're doing, because you're following God's instructions, you look like you're not well. You, you, you look like you're pretending to be coping. You look like this peace that you say you have is, is, is just affirmations that you say every morning. But when you go to bed, you probably are not sleeping and you're going out of your mind. But no. God says, leave the child in the Nile River. The princess. Ooh, see, if I was Moses' mother, I would do everything in my power to be very far from the river. Ooh, let alone anyone from the house of Pharaoh. Now, 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 she takes her newborn to the river. Then her newborn gets taken. You see, under the wisdom of God, what is meant to kill you will elevate you. I'm running out of time. What is meant to kill you will elevate you. You, you, you see how, how, how that thing broke your heart and, and the betrayal crushed you? God uses that to elevate you. You, you. you see how that marriage didn't work out and you feel like you were a great failure? God uses that to elevate you. You see that job that you lost and you felt like it was the end of the world? God uses that to elevate you. You see those friends who turned their backs on you and moved away from you and said all sorts of things even though you felt you were telling them in confidence? God uses that to elevate you. You see it's the very things that the devil had sought out to kill you that God uses to not only protect you, but to elevate you. The Bible tells us in, in, in chapter 2, verse 5, that soon Pharaoh's daughter went down to Bath and she finds this child. It was love at first sight. She knew she needed to protect this child. But God's wisdom will always provide provision. See, when Moses' mother put Moses in the Nile River, Moses' sister was standing as watch over him. Woo! See, may God give us people who will watch over us from a distance. Who will, who will stand as gatekeepers that anytime anything happens to us, they're ready to stand in the gap. So, so Moses' mother puts Moses' sister to watch over Moses. At a glance, you look at Moses' mother and think she's a stupid woman. You think she she she's a she's a she's a she, she didn't think it well, you know. And now she's using her daughter to stand there. But when the princess arrives, the daughter then runs to the princess and says, Do you want me to find a Hebrew woman who will nurse this baby for you? God will provide. Long story short, that's how Moses comes to be. And Moses now grows up with Pharaoh as his grandfather. <laughs> After Pharaoh made a decree that all boys should be killed. But Moses' mother uses God's wisdom and teaches Moses that even though he's growing up, in Pharaoh's house, even though he's adopted by Pharaoh's daughter, even though Pharaoh himself is his grandfather by virtue of the daughter adopting him, that he should not forget that he is a Hebrew. So irregardless of where he was, he was clear that he was a Hebrew. How do we know this? If you go to chapter 3, you see him defend his fellow Hebrews. To a point where he kills an Egyptian for treating a Hebrew unfairly. By virtue of what he looked like, where he grew up, 
the schools that he went to, the places he was exposed to, the world of knowledge that he had. By first glance, you would have thought he was Egyptian. But by design and by purpose, by mandate, by birth, by predestined, he was a Hebrew. It's him remembering who he is and standing up for who he is and whose he is. Where God then separates him. In chapter 3, we see that Moses then has a conversation with God. This conversation is often referred to as the burning bush. God has a way of finding us. See, a lot of us think that we have to be in the palace to encounter God. Mm -hmm. You think that you've got to have that paycheck first to encounter God. You, you think that you've got to be around the important people first for you to see God. You think, you think you've got to be in the palace. The Bible tells us that when Pharaoh finds out that Moses killed the Egyptian, Pharaoh himself now is on a mission to kill Moses because he remembers as well that Moses is not an Egyptian. He may have grown up in the palace, but he's not an Egyptian. See, the world will remind you that you don't belong to them. You're not of us. You don't have to be in the palace for God to encounter you. Moses moves to protect his life. He starts a new life and he has an encounter with God. In chapter 3, verse 11, the Bible tells us that when God speaks to Moses and calls on him and gives him a mandate to say, I've heard the cries of my people. I've seen the injustices that are taking place with my people. I've seen their tears. I've seen their struggles. I've seen how hard the slavery has been on them. It's now time to rescue them. And God calls Moses to do the rescue job. We're going to Exodus 4. And verse 11, Moses protests, the Bible says. Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Oh, please just write that down. Exodus 3, verse 11. But Moses protests to God. Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? Moses is appearing before God. He's talking to the maker of heaven and earth. He's talking to the great I am. He's talking to the everlasting He's talking to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He is talking to the one who is not limited by space, time, or matter. He's speaking directly to the Creator. Woo! He's speaking to the God over all things. And, 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 and when he protests to this great being, he asks God a question. Who am I? To appear before Pharaoh. Woo! I wasn't meant to park here, but I'm going to park here a little bit. See, see, you have an opportunity to dwell in the most secret places with your God. And then your boss is an obstacle. Ah! And then the people that you feel have the life that you desire are an obstacle. And then you are scared to talk to the rich about Jesus because who are you to stand before them? But you stand before God daily. I want you to see how twisted our minds and our perception can be that here is Moses. The Bible tells us that when he recognizes that it's God speaking to him, that he quickly wants to turn away because he is in awe of this God. And and God says, no, I will be with you. R relax. Let's have a conversation. But when God dare mentions him standing before Pharaoh, watch this. There are things that we have made gods over our lives. So much so that when God himself speaks to us, we want to protest. Woo. No. That's not why we're here today. Woo. Mm. 
Mm. So much so that when God himself speaks, there are other things, there are systems, there are institutions, there are ideologies, there are people that we put before God as impossible for us to appear before. When in actual fact, if you can stand before the Lord, who can you not stand in front of? The Bible says, who can be against us? In verse 13, again, Moses protests and says, if I go to the people of Israel and tell them the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? Moses had every excuse in the book to pull out for him not to do what God was asking him to do. Firstly, it was his insecurities about standing before power. And that's why as Christians, we can keep quiet when things are going in the opposite direction of the call of God because we, 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 we're scared of power. We're scared of normal. We're scared of status quo. We, we, we don't want to rattle any feathers you you we, we don't want to make the pharaohs of our world and our time uncomfortable that's why we can sit back and watch that's why legislations can come in and out and we sit back and watch that's why people can die daily and uh, we sit and, and, and watch. That's why homes can be broken and children hungry and, and homeless. And, and we sit and we watch. Because we don't want to go against power. Exodus 4. We're out of time. <laughs> Exodus 4 opens up with. But Moses protests again. I like Moses because he reminds me of us. But oftentimes when God is asking us to do things, like I said, we're coming up with all sorts of excuses of why we can't and it shouldn't be us and it should be somebody else. And, 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 and Moses first made it about Pharaoh power. Then he made it about people around him, peers. See, see, there are three levels that we're scared to present God in. It's to power, it's our peers, then it's ourselves. The first time Moses protests, it's because he's speaking to power and authority, whatever he deems as greater than him in the land. His second protest is the people around him, your peers. See, see, some of us are maintaining relationships with people around us at the cost of our relationship with God. Some of us are quiet in the spaces where we're supposed to be speaking and vocal and not silent because, because it matters what your peers think about you more than it matters what God has instructed you to do. Woo! We don't want to hear that. We, we don't even want to think that of ourselves, but, it, but it's true that here is Moses appeared before the maker of heaven and earth. And he has the privilege of encountering God. In fact, the Bible tells him that as he was coming closer to the burning bush, God says, wait, slow down, take off your sandals. You're standing on holy ground. Yet the ones that he can stand with his shoes, both on his feet, he has greater concern for them. More than the one that he can't even have his shoes because he's in his presence. Woo! Power, peers, and self. In Exodus 4, when Moses protests this time, He says, what if they won't believe me or listen to me? What if they say the Lord never appeared to you? 
what what if they say you're not you're not good enough what if what if they say you're not really called of god what, what if they say that you you won't redefine marriage with your relationship with your husband or wife what if uh, you know you you really can't be the one who will be the turnaround point for your family and its entire generation uh, what if what if you can't change your 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 community what god did not how could god have possibly appeared to me what if they don't believe that i am who you say i am self I love God. Verse 2. Then the Lord asked him, what is it that you have in your hand? What God was immediately doing or saying or showing to Moses was that you're enough. And I want to come here this afternoon or this evening in the same spirit to say that you're enough. See, after everything that Moses was saying, God knew. That he needed to reach out to Moses for Moses to know that he was enough. And I don't know who's in this live who's watching it and is not feeling enough. And, 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 and maybe people have said stuff about you. And maybe, maybe things haven't gone as well as you had planned or wanted them to go. Maybe, maybe you haven't quite lived out the life that you had envisioned for yourself. A lot like, like, like Moses. Maybe, 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 maybe you're finding yourself in this loop and, it's not, and, and God is going. What is it that you have in your hand? God was saying you were worth saving. Woo! God was saying you were worth saving. Woo! You were worth the orchestration of, of, of the Nile River. You were worth the orchestration of placing your sister strategically. Woo! You were worth the orchestration of making your parents have the wisdom enough to keep you hidden for three months before taking you up. You were worth the orchestration to make sure that the princess on that day felt she needed to bath in the Nile River in that particular spot. Woo! You were worth the orchestration to raise you with your mother. Woo! So for you to know that you are a Hebrew. Woo! You were worth the orchestration for me to plant you in Pharaoh's house. For you to know exactly who Pharaoh is, how Pharaoh functions, and how he views himself. You were worth the orchestration. Leading us to this moment where I ask you, what is it that you have in your hand? You're worth it. You're enough. You are exactly what I'm looking for. You are exactly what I came for. You are exactly what I died for. You are exactly what I orchestrated Jesus Christ to do on the cross for. You are it. Mind you, when, when, when God is having this conversation with Moses, Moses is a murderer. See, some of us are looking at the things you've done in the past. And you've canceled yourself out. And God is saying you were worth the orchestration. Even when you made the mistakes, it didn't change that I orchestrated everything to get to you. You are enough. What is it that you have in your hand? Woo! What an affirmation. What, what, what a love for God just to say in the midst of everything that I said, what is it that you have in your hand. Moses responded. A shepherd's staff. Verse 3. This is God now speaking to him. Throw it on the ground. The Lord told him. So Moses threw the staff. The rod. On the ground. And it turned into a snake. Moses jumped back. Ooh, somebody say a full dress rehearsal. Yeah. Moses jumped back in verse 4. Then the Lord told him, reach out and grab it by its tail. So Moses reached out and grabbed it by its tail. And it turned back into a rod or a shepherd's staff, depending on the translation that you're reading, when it was in his hand. Verse 5. Perform this sign, the Lord told him. 
Then they will believe that the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, really has appeared to you. Really has appeared to you. Mudimu wa haka bragdi se ndalwe. Eriko bonso gen twena yetu ajwa. Let me make it clear. Let me make it simple for you to see. A full dress rehearsal. It's the word of God. God said in verse 4, Then the Lord told him, Reach out and grab it by its tail. And Moses reached out and grabbed it. And it turned back into a shepherd's staff in his hand. Five. Perform the sign. Do what we rehearsed. Do what I've instructed you to do. So you see, don't walk into that room intimidated. We've done it before. Woo! Don't walk into that room feeling small. We've gone over it before. Woo! Don't walk in feeling like you won't be able to achieve it. You and I have gone through this before. The Bible says in verse 5, perform this sign. Do what we rehearsed. Then they will really know that I appeared to you. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand inside his cloak. I want you to see the pattern of what's taking place right now. God speaks, Moses follows. God speaks, Moses. It's a full dress rehearsal. The same Moses who was protesting. The same Moses who had a lot of things to say. The, the same Moses who had commentary in between. They won't believe me. And now Moses is in full rehearsal mode. God says, put your hand in your cloak. Moses puts his hand in his cloak. Then he took it out again. His hand was as white as snow with a severe skin disease. Verse 7, now put, this is God, now put your hand back in your cloak, said the Lord. So Moses, God speaks, Moses does. So Moses puts his hand back and takes it out again. And it was as healthy as the rest of his body. Verse 8, the Lord said to Moses, if they don't believe you, and are not convinced by the first miraculous sign. They will be convinced by the second sign. Somebody say it's a full dress rehearsal. God is taking you through step by step. That if this happens, then I'm going to need you to fast and pray. If this happens, study the word to show yourself approved. If this happens, confess the word of the Lord. If this happens, stay faithful in prayer. If this happens, seek the face of the Lord. If this happens, surround yourself with godly counsel. If this hey, there's instructions and there's actions. It's a full dress rehearsal. Verse 9, and if they don't believe or listen to you, even after those two signs, then take some water from the Nile River. Woo! Take water from where you were meant to die. Take water from the place where as God has showed up in your life. Woo! Take water from the Nile River and pour it out on the dry ground. When you do, the water from the Nile will turn to blood on the ground. It's a full dress rehearsal. I think it was last week or the week before we spoke about the secret place. We spoke about intimacy. We spoke about spending time with God outside of people, outside of anything. It's just you, God, and the Word and the Holy Spirit. It's, I spoke about it because, because it's the training ground. And this is, this is the place where God gives instructions and you do. Because you and God have got to do it over and over again. See, see, the dress rehearsal is important because there will, time, whew, there will come a time where what you've rehearsed with God in private 
is now what you have to do in front of Pharaoh and his officials. So what gives us the confidence to go into the world? What gives us the audacity to stand against power? What gives us the confidence to stand amongst our peers and declare Jesus? Ha! What gives us woo, the affirmation and confirmation that we have the right to live out what God has called us to be, even though within ourselves there's insecurities? No, 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 no. It's not because we hype ourselves. It's not because we listen to worship music all the time. It's not because we, we bounce around and have cool Christian sayings to say. No, it's because of the training ground. It's because of the dress rehearsal. What is the dress rehearsal? The dress rehearsal is God's instruction. Me following through. God's instruction. Me following through. It's God's instruction. Me following through. Because there will come a time where I will have to do that which I did with God. In front of Pharaoh, power, his officials, my peers, and myself. You got 10 minutes. And if they don't believe you, this is verse 9 of chapter 4, or listen to you even after these two signs, fetch the water from the Nile. Listen to Moses. In verse 10, Moses pleaded with the Lord, Oh Lord, I'm not very good with words. I have never been. And I'm not even now, even though you have spoken to me, I get tongue tied and my words get tangled. A lot of people get disappointed at Moses in verse 10. And I must be quite honest, I, I, I used to form part of the group that, that was disappointed with Moses because I felt, hey boo, Moses, I've had such a great conversation with God and God training you and teaching you and you guys going through the dress rehearsal. How, why would you say what you say? Oh, then I realized that from chapter three, when Moses encounters God, All Moses has been trying to say all along. But did not find the words to bring it to God. Oof, I hope somebody's catching me. But, but did not know how to express it to God. And, 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 and didn't know how to present it to God. See, see, intimacy will allow you to speak your truth. Intimacy with God will allow a level of vulnerability that will seem nonsensical to us. But a doorway for God to love on you. Oof, I hope somebody can hear me. See, see, a lot of us as Christians are living in the facade. We're living in the packaged. We're living in the what we think God wants to hear. We're living in the what we think Christians should be doing. We're living in the what we see other Christians are doing. But intimacy with God brings you to a place when you can tell your father how you feel. From chapter 3 right down to this very moment, all Moses was trying to say was, can't speak. What shall I say when they say this? How can I stand in front of Pharaoh and his officials? I can't speak. I 
hear you. you you're giving me signs and you, you're giving me things to do and you, you're giving me instructions, but I can't speak. That's why we call him Abba. we call him Abba that's why he's Abba that's why he's Abba that's why he's Abba he's our father he's Abba he's the great king yes he's the ruler yes he is majesty yes he is the king of kings and the lords of lords all creation bow down to him at the very breath and the speaking of his word everything came to be but he is also Abba and in our secret place in relationship with him in intimacy with him is where we get to tell him where we're struggling. Is where we get to tell him where the load is too heavy. It's where we get to tell him how we really feel. It's it's where we get to tell him what hurts. It's where we get to tell him what hurt us about that situation. It's where we get to tell him why we feel so insecure about that. It's where we get to speak to Abba. It's in intimacy. I I know people glorify the anointing. I know people glorify the signs and the wonders. I I, I know that the, the big trick and the big story here is that he can take his rod and, and throw it on the ground and it turns into a snake. But for me, the miracle woo, is him being able to come to his father, having done all of the dress rehearsal, having done all of the training, having done everything that God had instructed him to do, having done everything that God had asked him to do having followed instruction word for word but still have room and space to come to him as your father verse 11 then the lord asks moses Who makes a person's mouth? Who decides whether the person speaks or does not speak? Hear or does not hear? Sees or does not see? Is it I? Is it not I, the Lord? Verse 12. Now go. I will be with you as you speak. And I will instruct you in what you say. I don't know who told us as Christians that we can't cry to our Father. I don't know who who gave us the lie that we're not allowed to be honest with God. I don't know who who got us in this loop that we can't plead with him. That we're not allowed to be vulnerable with him. Verse 13. But Moses again pleads with God. He says, Lord, please send someone else. in my spirit so strong. I don't know who I'm talking to and maybe that is the conversation you're having with God. That God should send someone else. Woo! That the load is too heavy for you. That that this is not what you signed up for. That this is this is not what you imagined it to be. And that 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 maybe God trusts you too much because it's it's way above your pedigree and and, and 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 this job that you're in you 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 don't feel that qualified for and then this place that you find yourself in but but God having done everything with Moses 
And Moses, having followed every instruction, still pleads with God to send somebody else. See, in that moment, God could have shut Moses' mouth forever and seen his act as disobedience. But two things are happening here. We see God as Abba, Father. And we see God as Savior. See, God had Moses in mind, but he also had the Israelites in mind. The Lord gets frustrated with Moses in chapter 14, in, in verse 14. And he says, all right. See, the insecurities we have or the limitations that we have or the fears and the lack we have, God knows the perfect solutions for them. God says, all right. What about your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know he speaks well. And look, he's on the way to meet you now. He will be delighted to see you. 15, talk to him and put the words in his mouth. I will be with you both as you speak. I will instruct you in what to do. Verse 16, Aaron will be your spokesman to the people. He will be your mouthpiece and will stand in the place of God for him, telling him what to say. Verse 17, and take your shepherd's staff with you and use it to perform the miraculous signs I have shown you. Verse 17, and keep in mind the dress rehearsal. Use it in the performance of life like I've shown you. So take the word of God with you and use it to perform the miraculous signs like I've shown you. Take, take the prayer life we have cultivated with you and use it to perform miraculous signs. Take the instructions I have given you and use it to perform the signs like I've shown you. Take, take the word of conviction I've given you and use it to perform the miraculous signs I have shown you. This dress rehearsals was not for nothing. Moses still gets to use the dress rehearsal. He still gets to throw the rod on the ground and it turns into a snake. Moreover, he gets to bring water out of a rock with the same rod. Moreover, later, God uses the same rod and Moses to part the Red Sea. See, the dress rehearsal is not to be taken for granted. I'm out of time. I question to you this afternoon is, Are you coming to rehearsal? Father, we thank you this afternoon. We thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord God, that we can be honest with you, vulnerable with you. Thank you for relationship. Thank you for the gift of intimacy with you. Thank you that we can do life with you. Thank you that, Lord God, even though we can bring up all sorts of excuses and, and limitations we may have in doing what you've called us to do. That you still train us. Thank you for the rehearsal. Thank you for the rehearsal that gives us confidence to perform and go out into the world. Thank you 
for the rehearsal. Thank you for teaching our hands to war. Thank you for the rehearsal. Thank you for giving us vocab from your word. Thank you for the rehearsal. Thank you for teaching our mouths to pray. Thank you. Thank you for the rehearsals. Thank you for a hard posture for God. Thank you for the rehearsal. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the rehearsal. Thank you for the word that we've heard over the years that we're now exercising and living and applying in our lives. Thank you for the rehearsals. Thank you for those intimate moments of love. Thank you for the rehearsal. Thank you, Lord God, for a first and confirming your word in us. Thank you for the rehearsal. Thank you, Lord God, for showing yourself as God in our secret place. Thank you for the rehearsal, Lord God. Thank you, thank you, thank you that there is nothing that we're facing out there, Lord God, that you have not yet prepared us for. Thank you. Thank you that there is nothing that is put on us that is overbearing, Lord God, that is too much. Thank you that everything we encounter has been weighed by you yourself. Thank you that you have given us the capacity to handle the next day. Thank you that you've given us the capacity to handle the performance. Thank you for the rehearsal. And Lord God, this afternoon, we want to pray. We want to pray that we show up. That we don't take the seasons of rehearsals lightly. Lord, we know we want to be in front. We want to be seen. We want to be heard. We want to be doing great and amazing things for you in our industries, in our career, in our relationships, in our families. But Lord God, I pray that we do not despise the rehearsal days. Holy Spirit, make us understand that if we don't get it in rehearsal, chances are we're not going to get it on stage. And some of us are frustrated because we keep on rehearsing. You, you, you keep saying, Holy Spirit, take it again from the top. Take it again from the top. And, and, and we're feeling frustrated because it feels like everybody is on scene 7, 8, 9, 10. And, and I'm still taking scene 1 from the top. But thank you for your revelation this afternoon, this evening, Lord God. That, that lets us know that the rehearsal is for the performance. And that our lives that we live with you is preparation for us to stand before kings and their officials. To display your power and your supremacy. To display that you are God. To rescue our generation. To make sure that we leave no room for doubt that indeed you are God and God alone. We honor you and we give you all the praise this afternoon. In Jesus' name we pray. Don't skip rehearsal. I gotta go, got a train to catch. We're out of time. Don't skip rehearsal. And sometimes it's frustrating because God keeps on making you do the same thing over again. Apply your faith in the same place. It's like, why do I always have to stress about money? Don't skip the rehearsal. Why, why do I have to learn to trust God's word? Don't, don't skip the rehearsal. Hmm. Why do I always have to be diligent in prayer? Don't, don't skip the rehearsal. Why, why, why is God making me spend so much time in the word? I already know Exodus and, and I've read this Bible 10 times over. Don't skip rehearsal. Why do I have to be the one that keeps on being kind and, and nice? Don't skip rehearsal. Why, why do I have to be the one that always pursue peace and, and say sorry first? Don't skip rehearsal. Why, why do I have to be the one to have the urge to pray for others, but no one is necessarily praying for me? Don't skip rehearsal. Don't skip rehearsal. Why, why do I have to be diligent in, in a work environment where there's corruption and everybody's just doing what they want to be doing? Don't skip rehearsal. Don't skip rehearsal. Don't skip rehearsal. Whatever you do, do not skip rehearsal. If you skip rehearsal, there is no saving of the Israelites. If you skip rehearsals, there is no parting of the Red Sea. If you skip rehearsal, there is no Pharaoh recognizing that God is God. If you skip rehearsal, a nation stays in savor. Don't skip rehearsal. I'll 
see you in rehearsal at 5 a.m. I love you. God bless you. God cover you. Until we meet again tomorrow morning for prayer. It's going to be tomorrow morning for you, but it's a little bit later for me tonight for me. Don't skip rehearsal. We have rehearsal at 5 a.m. Woo! Don't skip rehearsal. That's my word. Ain't nobody got to get it but me today. Woo! It's my word. Y'all came to watch me get my word. It's my word. Don't skip rehearsal. I love you. God bless you. I'm going to put on an accent right now because, you know, I'm about to hit the streets of New York. I'm about to take the subway. Uh, it's about 3 o'clock. It's, it's 2 o'clock. Um, I'll see you at 11 p.m., but it will be 5 a.m. South African time. CTA, not me. <laughs> Let me get out of here. I'm going to be late for work. I love you guys. God bless you. Don't skip rehearsal. Woo! So good. Thank you, Jesus. So good. So good. Hallelujah. Love you guys. I'll see you soon.